Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves, an immortality. Emily Dickinson, an American poet, is the embodiment of the multifaceted persona. She is the mysterious hermit, the poetic genius misunderstood, the meditative philosopher, the visionary woman ahead of her time, and to some, just a girl longing for true admiration. To many Dickinson scholars and critics, her poetry enacts lyricism in the most intense and purest form. To them, she is the epitome of the lyric poet. Born in Amherst, Massachusetts, in the year of 1830, Emily Dickinson was raised in a respectable family deeply rooted in New England. Her father was a state legislator, a rather public figure, while her grandfather was known as the founder of Amherst College. Contrary to the public lives lived by these men, Dickinson is best known as a secluded, reclusive poet, who wore only white dresses and had barely stepped out of her home throughout her adult years. While she had a few correspondents, she remained recognized as a private person, a poet and hermit. A few poems were published in her lifetime, but most of her works were made public posthumously after her sister Lavinia discovered the manuscript books. In these manuscripts, her poems were copied into small booklets, which are now called fascicles. Dickinson made these small volumes herself and arranged them carefully. In addition, her envelope poems and letters continue to fascinate readers nowadays. The representation of the form of her envelope poems represents the impossibility to illustrate the enigmatic complexity offered by seeing the fragments as compared to the printed version of Dickinson's poetry. While we might be tempted to read too much into the meaning of the physical attributes, these envelope poems urge us to think about the more important question: What is the relationship between materiality? And the ethereal meaning of poetry. Emily Dickinson's poetry often meditates upon the idea of death. Perhaps the most famous one would be "Because I Could Not Stop for Death." It is not difficult to argue that death or the idea of death is haunting Dickinson's poem, but she does not seem to mind it. In fact, she personified death as a civilized gentleman who, without urgency or haste, Picked the speaker up at the end of her life. Her other poem, "Save in Their Alabaster Chambers," never once mentions the word death or die in the poem. It is when we reach the fourth line, words like sleep and resurrection signify the theme of death to the readers. Followed by rafter and roof, the repetition of the R sound of resurrection seems to linger in our mind for a little too long. Unwilling to go away, the S sound from the alliteration of sleep, satin, and stone is almost hypnotizing, luring the readers to return to the first line, which also begins and ends with the S sound, safe in their alabaster chambers, framing us with the sound just as the dead bodies are framed by their coffins. Emily Dickinson's life has been made public nowadays with TV shows, documentaries, and other media. The original manuscripts of her collection of works can be easily found in Harvard University and Amherst College. Perhaps the most intriguing aspect of her poems is their ability to leave you wanting more. Scholars cannot resist the impulse to dig into the personal life of the poet in an attempt to construct their versions of Emily Dickinson. Dickinson, the poet who consciously removed herself from the public's eyes in the commercial landscape, secluded and solitary than most others, could be anticipating an audience who can envision a certain slant of light through her poetry. Even if the act of writing means the wounding of oneself, like an imperial affliction. Thank you for watching.